So, um, so yesterday uh, we um, wrote uh, the localization formula, which be, will be essentially the hero of uh, my next lectures. And so the formula says that uh, the partition function reduces to an integral over a subset of uh, field configurations. Uh, let me put this label BPS, and I will explain in a, in a minute what I mean. And then we have the classical action evaluated on these field configurations. And then there is a remnant of the fact that we reduced uh, uh, on this submanifold, uh, which comes from small quadratic oscillations around uh, this, um, this submanifold. Uh, this is because these small quadratic fluctuations or infinitesimal fluctuations are not suppressed. Uh, but in fact, they are, since they are quadratic, this is uh, a set of harmonic oscillators. And so this just gives us um, the Gaussian factor, so uh, 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 ratio of determinants. OK, I think this was the notation I used. OK, so, um, so something, something that uh, I said at the end of the lecture, but let me stress it again. So this is still, uh, I mean, in general, this is still some infinite dimensional space. So it's still a hard problem. But in good situations, well, the good situations are the ones in which this uh, submanifold becomes finite dimensional. Uh, because then this reduces to a standard integral, and we can have some hope to, to solve it. Um, OK, the other comment uh, is that this, in fact, is an exact formula, although we computed it with a sort of set the, uh, set the point approximation. But because of the fact that there was no dependence on this deformation parameter, the result is exact. And then finally, I would like to explain this label. So uh, at, this, at this point, how this, this was derived was just the zero locus of this uh, functional that we chose uh, with some nice properties. But in fact, in most examples, it turns out that this zero locus uh, corresponds, or it can be chosen, uh, to, to, to correspond to BPS configurations, so configurations that solve the BPS equations. And the reason is the following, that one can try to make a canonical choice for this B. And this canonical choice, so if, if you wish this is similar, to what we did in the finite dimensional case, where uh, we started with the form beta, but then we say, let's choose beta to be actually the one form which is due to the vector field. So here also, one can try to make a canonical choice. Uh, so this is a sum of all the fermions in the theory. And then we take q psi uh, double dagger psi. So this double dagger, what is this double dagger? Well, essentially, uh, as we say, we go to Euclidean signature, so we complexify all the fields. And so uh, fields that are complex conjugate in Lorentzian signature, they become independent in uh, Euclidean signature. And so here, we can just try to choose some uh, uh, anti-linear operator, okay? which is like a dagger, but it doesn't need to be the, the dagger in, in Lorentzian signature. Um, so we make this standard choice, and then uh, um, and then uh, um, um, and then what happens? So, OK, we have to check whether this v satisfies the property that delta b v is equal to 0. Um, so uh, but then the nice thing is that when this happens, if we compute q v, so q can act on this. Uh, and then uh, so what we get here is uh, q psi double dagger q psi, and then it can act on this. And then we get q of q psi uh, double dagger psi. Now, this is a fermionic term, because this is a fermion. And this will also contain another, at least another fermion. Uh, well, this is the bosonic term. Uh, but then you see that this is automatically positive. And, uh, um, and the zero locus correspond, precisely corresponds to uh, q psi equal to 0. So for the zero locus, we find the uh, BPS uh, equations. 
Um, and then, okay, if you have chosen a contour, we have to restrict. So in general, these BPS equations can contain lots of solutions, because in general we have complexified fields. But then if you have chosen a contour, we should restrict to these equations to the contour. And then, uh, uh, okay, one, one gets what, um, uh, what they get. Okay. So, um, are, are there questions? Okay, so now uh, let's start with uh, another topic that in my notes is lecture two. <laughs> um, and so, so now I would like to discuss a concrete example. So, so far everything was, uh, was uh, very general. And uh, um, in fact, this is the main theme of uh, also other lectures where other cases are discussed and probably you, you will hear or maybe you will hear this story again explained with different words, which is, which is good. Uh, but now I would like to go to uh, a specific example, or examples. And so I would like to discuss uh, two-dimensional theories with uh, a certain amount of supersymmetry, which is 2,2, uh, which corresponds to four supercharges. And uh, in fact, this is uh, a dimensional reduction of four dimensional n equal one. So uh, essentially, you are, uh, or you, you should already be familiar with this uh, type of supersymmetry. Uh, many things are similar to four dimensions. And uh, okay, this is a nice example for various reasons. Uh, well, for me, uh, this is a nice example because I've worked on this example, so I'm more familiar with this setup. Uh, but it's also I mean, we are in low dimensions, so things are relatively simple. And it's, it's easy to do all the computations uh, on the blackboard, or almost all of them. Uh, but still, uh, one can get very interesting physics, as, as we will see. So OK, so let me say a few things about this uh, supersymmetry. So if we start in Lorentzian signature, Uh, so as these notations uh, suggest, so uh, there are left-moving and right-moving spinors in two dimensions, which in Lorentzian signature are not related by charge conjugation. And so we have one complex left-moving supercharge and one complex right-moving supercharge. And the biggest R symmetry that we can have is uh, uh, u1 times u1. There is a u1 that acts on this complex supercharge, another one on, on this other complex supercharge. And uh, uh, well, if we want, we can do a change of basis and talk about a vector-like R symmetry and an axial R symmetry. They're just the uh, diagonal, anti-diagonal combination. Uh, but of course, as uh, also uh, Guido stressed uh, various times, so this is not uh, part of the supersymmetry algebra in flat space. This is an outer automorphism of the algebra. And so supersymmetric theory does not need to have this, uh, this uh, R symmetry. Uh, it can have it, but it's not, it's not required. Uh, it becomes required if the theory is superconformal, because then the R symmetry is part of the algebra. Um, however, we will restrict to theories in which these, these R symmetries is present. So we uh, insist, uh, or we, we chose, class of theories uh, that the vector like is, uh, is present. So U and V uh, R symmetry. Um, OK, so now in general, there can be two uh, central charges for, for this algebra. But if we insist that these are symmetries present, then there is only one central charge, which is related to the uh, possibly broken uh, axial symmetry. And the reason is that these central charges are charged under the two symmetries. So if you have the central charge, you're breaking the symmetry and vice versa. And so in this case, we can have one complex central charge. <coughs> in 
fact, in the superconformal theory where we have both symmetries, these central charges are zero. And if you want to have both central charges, you need to break those, uh, those symmetries. And so uh, now if we go on uh, Euclidean signature, uh, but still on flat space, uh, the supersymmetry algebra looks like the following. Uh, hopefully I, I don't have notational mistakes. So now in Euclidean, I will use a tilde to uh, indicate what uh, uh, should be the complex conjugate in, uh, in uh, um, Lorentzian signature, but, but, but is independent in Euclidean signature. And so what we have here is, uh, of course, we have uh, uh, translations. Uh, or if you want, this is a, like a lead derivative. Uh, but then there, are also, there is also this complex central charge. So let me write in this term in these ways, in this way. Uh, okay, so what I mean by this notation is that really I want to use by, by spinner notation. So this P mu should be rewritten. Well, this is in fact rewritten in by spinner notation with the gamma matrices. And these projectors are the chirality projectors. So spinors in two dimensions are uh, two component, uh, the complex uh, Dirac spinors. So these are uh, chi chirality projection projectors on positive chirality and negative chirality. Uh, we could call them uh, one plus or minus gamma three over, over two. Okay, while this uh, Z, sorry, I didn't write the Z. So this Z and Z tilde, this, uh, so this is the complex central charge, and I'm using a tilde again because in Euclidean it becomes uh, independent. Okay, uh, while the QQ and Q tilde, Q tilde are uh, anti-commutator are zero. Uh, and then we assign our charges to, this, to these uh, supercharges. So Q alpha will have uh, R charge plus one, and Q tilde beta will have R charge minus one. Okay, so... Um, So, uh, so now we want to put these theories on curved uh, space. So we follow the route that uh, uh, Guido uh, explained to us. So first you should discuss uh, supercurrent multiplets. Uh, but as I said, this amount of supersymmetry is dimensional reduction of four dimension L equal one. And so in fact, uh, everything is essentially dimensional reduction of that case. And so in particular, since we have uh, this uh, R symmetry, uh, there exists an R multiplet. Uh, which is the dimensional reduction of the R multiplet in four dimensions. Um, and it contains the following operators. Uh, so it contains the stress tensor, it contains the uh, supersymmetry current, uh, and then it contains uh, the uh, current, the conserved current for the, for the R symmetry. Uh, and, but then there's also the central charge, and so it contains uh, a complex conserved current for the, for the, for the central charge. Uh, Correspondingly to this R multiplet, there is an off -shell, a two-dimensional off-shell supergravity theory, which is the dimensional reduction of uh, new minimal supergravity in four dimensions, in which the graviton multiplet uh, precisely contains fields which uh, are going to be paired with these operators. Okay? Uh, because at the linearized level, the fields in the graviton multiplet couple uh, linearly to the operators in the... In the um, in the super, uh, super current multiplet. Um, and, so, um, and so in this, in this uh, graviton multiplet, we have the metric, uh, we have the gravitino, uh, 
Uh, and then we have vector fields for, uh, for these uh, guys. So there is a vector field that couples to the R symmetry, and there is a complex vector field that couples to the complex central charge. So how, so of course we know how the metric appears in the, in, uh, in the theory. Uh, how do these uh, ve vector fields appear in the theory? Uh, well, first of all, they appear in covariant derivatives, obviously. So, uh, so every time there is some covariant derivative, this will be a covariant derivative with respect to the curved metric. But then it contains terms like this, so where r is the r charge, and this is the vector field that caps to the r charge. Uh, and then, uh, okay, in this particular notation where I use complex uh, currents and complex vectors, again, if I didn't make a mistake, uh, it should look like the following. Uh, so this vector field, uh, uh, appears in the covariant derivative weighted by the central charge. Uh, so depending on which fields it acts, it will be coupled in a different way. Uh, it turns out that these fields also appear through their field strengths. And so, but since we are in two dimensions, so field strength is a two form, but we are in two dimensions, it's convenient to dualize it to a scalar. And so we can use some scalar h, which is, um, up to some factor is just the dual to uh, um, the, fi the, the field strength for C, uh, and then corresponding, there is an H tilde uh, So OK, so these are the, the fields that appear in the supergravity in the supergravity multiplet, in the, the graviton multiplet. And so if you want to study uh, supersymmetry on curved manifolds, uh, we should uh, look at the, well, essentially we should set to zero the variation of the, of the fermions in this multiplet. And in this case, the only fermion is the, is the gravitino. There is no gaugeino or something like that. Uh, and so setting those variations to zero is what uh, is some, sometimes or usually called the generalized killing spinner equation. So this equation looks like the following. Sorry, I call this B. And there is a similar equation for uh, um, the tilted fields. OK, so these are the, uh, the, the gravitino variations in this supergravity theory. Now, here the dots uh, correspond to terms which are, I mean, appear in the full nonlinear theory, but that are automatically zero if we set uh, uh, the gravitino to zero. Um, so we don't care about them in this generalized, uh, I mean, just if you want to. Um, set uh, the, the, these variations to zero because we also set at the same time the psi to zero. Uh, so the equation that we have to solve is, 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 is this. And uh, yes, and so we have, uh, so we have this, so the covariant derivative. So this is uh, the parameter for supersymmetry variations. This parameter is not charged under the central charges. So only this R symmetry vector field appears, uh, but those fields appear in the, uh, through the, the field strength. Uh, and moreover, here I'm using a notation. Uh, so if you want, this is a spinor. And here, for clarity, I've, I've chosen a base in which uh, chirality is uh, diagonalized. So I've chosen a base in which gamma 3 is, is 1 minus 1. Um, otherwise, you can write in an invariant way with projectors, but it's more messy. I mean, it's not messy, but it's longer to write. Um, 
OK, and OK, this reflects the fact that two supercharges are opposite charges. Um, OK, so essentially we want to, if we want to study supersymmetry on core manifold, we have to solve these equations. Um, so before doing that, uh, let me just uh, say something uh, which is useful. So we are in two dimensions. And so the group of rotation is SO2, uh, which is U1. And so, um, and so essentially, um, uh, the bundle in which uh, any field with spin transforms uh, is, is the same as a, a Billy gauge bundle. So there is no real difference between the spin, or there is not much difference between the spin and some uh, standard abelian charge. Uh, and so we can use this to simplify our notation a little bit. So first of all, we can take the spin connection and uh, um, sorry, so we can take so we can take the spin connection, uh, which uh, if these are some field bind basis, this is anti-symmetric and is the algebra of SO2, and we can just convert it in a standard abelian gauge field. So we just multiply by epsilon, uh, and we can define some omega mu. Uh, I mean, this is, this is trivial. So the spin connection is a billion gauge field. Um, but then this is useful because now if we take the covariant derivative and we act uh, on a, a field with some spin s and we look at a specific component, so uh, of course each component will have some, some value for the, for the spin, um, for, for, for the z component if you want. Uh, so this is just going to be the same as, uh, uh, so the, 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 the spin appears as a charge, uh, and we have this abelian ga ga gauge field. So, uh, so the, the spin just appears as some um, abelian charge, and if a field is actually charged under some other uh, gauge field, uh, these other gauge fields will appear in the same way here. Okay. I mean, this is trivial, but it's, it's, it's useful. Uh, do you have any questions so far? OK, um, so another observation uh, that we want to make is that, uh, again, before going to uh, solve these equations, uh, it's about the, the form algebra. Um, so as we said, when we go on a curve manifold, uh, the, the number of generators is a subset. Uh, what is the, the number of generators of the supersymmetry algebra is a subset of the generators that we have on flat space, but the algebra can be deformed, and we are restricting to relevant uh, deformations. So the formation that disappear when the manifold is scaled to have an infinite volume, and and we can read off this. Um, this uh, the form algebra just from supergravity by substituting solutions uh, into the supergravity. And so, well, essentially, even before, so even before solving the equations, well, okay. uh, I mean, you can write, uh, uh, in general, what the form algebra is in, in terms of those fields. And the specific algebra will depend on wha what is the profile uh, that, that those fields will take on a solution. And so uh, the result that you obtain is the following. So let me uh, rewrite it in terms of uh, uh, some delta epsilon. So for me, delta epsilon is just a contraction. So let's just say uh, uh, well, it's a contraction of the, the parameter, the supersymmetry parameter, which is a solution of those equations with the, super, the supersymmetry charge that you have in supergravity. Uh, so it turns out that here, so uh, you get uh, a Lie derivative. So uh, there is a translation. And this Lie derivative is along a vector field, which uh, is specified by, in fact, is a bilinear in these in this, uh, spinners. So this k mu is a standard formula, uh, formula which is sometimes called a sandwich. 
because you take these two spinners. Uh, but, but then, uh, okay, if the, well, it turns out that if you act on some gauge variant field, this should also be the gauge covariant uh, Lie derivative. Uh, but then there is also an extra piece, which is again a, um, a sandwich, which depends on a matrix Q. So this is a matrix in spinner space. And this matrix Q is given by the following. So again, it's diagonal in uh, chirality. Um, and, so, and so this matrix Q is controlled by the central charges. It's controlled by the profile of this uh, scalar H, which is the field strength of, uh, of, uh, this, of that field. And then there is also this sigma. Um, that I haven't introduced. So this appears when you couple to some matter action and then you go in best domino gauge. And essentially, well, we will see, describe this in more details uh, afterwards, but essentially this is, the, um, this is related to, to twisted masses. So some masses you can turn on in the, in the, um, in the theory. Uh, and there are uh, background fields. So if you want, these are scalars which appear in the vector multiplet, so not in the graviton multiplet. So if you want, this formula is already a little bit more generic, uh, because as also Guido explained, if in our theory we have some symmetries, we can play a similar trick with vector multiplets, right? If you have some symmetry, we can couple the theory to a background gauge field. This background gauge field uh, appears in a super multiplet, and so there will be other bosonic fields in this multiplet. One of these fields is a scalar, and one can turn it on in a way that preserves supersymmetry, and then this appears in this, uh, in this algebra. OK, uh, while the other ones are 0. And similarly for the tilted version. Excuse me, should this uh, super algebra also include R symmetry? And uh, yes. Uh, yes, you see it here. That depends on the R charge. So, okay, my writing is not the best. So this is a small r. So it depends on uh, on the R on the R charge. Um, uh, and so um, Yes, and so this reflects the fact that uh, uh, in this deformed superalgebra, the R symmetry enters. Um, <laughs> it does shift not coupled to H. Right? H is the field strength of C coupling to the center charge current. Yes. Uh, yeah, so I think that the term that you are referring to, let's see. Uh, so that should enter. I mean, if something is, ch let's see. Let's see. Yeah, I think if, if something is charged under the R symmetry, that will appear in this, in this Lie derivative. Uh, so this superscript means that you have to put all the gauge fields uh, that are relevant. I mean, if you, it depends on what you act on. Um, yeah. Yeah, we're not very precise in my notes, but I think this is what, what happens. OK. What A means? So this A means is that uh, so if you act uh, on an uh, operator which is gauge invariant and, uh, and uh, neutral under everything, this is just the lead derivative. Uh, but if this field is charged, uh, either because it's, uh, I mean, you're acting on the fields in the Lagrangian, so they are gauge covariant, they're not invariant, then this A is the gauge field, the dynamical gauge field. Uh, but I think if you act on, a, on, on an operator which is charged under the R symmetry, uh, then you should also include the, the, the V here. So if it's charged, it, it would act by like LK minus A mu or something? Or minus I A mu? Like, it would be like taking a covariant derivative but replacing del mu with the Lie derivative? Uh, yeah, so you can take, uh, yeah, so for this Lie derivative, you, I mean, this defines the anti-commutator of D and uh, the contraction with a vector field. 
and so you have to make uh, d into a ga oh, you gauge. Just, you uh, just bracket cover and derivative with the vector field contraction. Yeah, if you want, yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, but we will see this more explicit in the in the examples. So okay. So now what I would like to do is to take uh, well, those equations. So not very well. So what we would like to do is to take these equations and and solve them. And uh, on very general uh, terms, you would like to, to find the uh, uh, most general set of uh, solutions. So in particular, you would like to solve in very general terms for the metric, and then for uh, some metric, for the mm, uh, vector fields V, and for the scalar H, and then uh, uh, in such a way that there is at least one solution in epsilon. So we'll not study uh, in, full, in full details uh, the solutions to these equations. This has been done by uh, Closset and Cremonesi. Um, 2014. Uh, instead, I would like just to present a few, a few uh, solutions which are interesting. So uh, a first simple solution that we can uh, uh, have on any uh, manifold, or probably I should say any orientable manifold, <coughs> uh, is the following. So, um, so we choose a vector field. Uh, that couples to the R symmetry uh, to exactly cancel the contribution of the spin connection in the covariant derivative in one of the two equations. Uh, let's say we, that we do it for the first one. Well, sorry, let me say it back. So, 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 so we set the vector field to, uh, to, to be equal, up to a factor one half, to the, to the spin connection um, in such a way that there is some cancellation. And now, um, and on the other hand, we set the scalar fields to zero. So now what's happening here? So epsilon and also epsilon tilde, they are two component spinors. Okay, so we are using this notation in which there is a epsilon plus and a epsilon minus, uh, because we are in the base in which we diagonalize chirality. So these components have spin plus one half and minus one half. Uh, and so if we use this notation, uh, now we, we could write the, the equations in components, and uh, for one component uh, transforms as it was charged under a billion gauge with the charge, with charge plus one half, and the other component with charge uh, minus one half. And so you see that if we make this choice for one of the two, so in the first equation, for one of the two components, we can precisely cancel V against uh, the spin connection. Of course, we cannot do it for both components, because the, the R charge is the same, uh, but the spin is opposite. So we can only cancel the contribution in one equation, not the other one. In the other one, they sum. Uh, but then something similar happens in the other equation, just for the other chirality. And so now the equation becomes, since H is 0, the equation just becomes that the spinner is constant. And of course, this is, uh, th this is a solution on any manifold. Uh, and so we can just set uh, epsilon to be uh, 0 epsilon minus with some constant epsilon minus uh, and epsilon tilde to be epsilon tilde plus 0, uh, where epsilon minus and epsilon plus tilde uh, are constant. OK, so this is a very simple solution, but it exists on any manifold. And in fact, this solution has been known for a long time. This is called the A-twist. So this is a type of uh, topological twist. What does this uh, terminology mean? Uh, well, the twist is a way to preserve supersymmetry in which the only thing that you do, uh, you have a theory with some R symmetry, and then you turn on a background for the vector field that couples to the R symmetry, 
which is related either is equal to the spin connection or is equal to some component of the spin connection in such a way that at least for some components of the spin or there is a cancellation between these vector fields, uh, the cup, cups of the asymmetry and the spin connection. And so for this, for some components, the equation simplifies and just becomes that, that component is constant. Um, and, and then there are solutions. And in particular, in the A twist, you do that using the vector like R symmetry. Um, and uh, um, so as I said, this solution has been known for a long time. Uh, however, it is reassuring that it appears, it is contained in this general formalism that is supposed to contain all uh, ways of, uh, well, at least using the R-multiplet, uh, or, or all ways to preserve supersymmetry on a core manifold. Uh, we can also go on and, uh, um, yeah, no, okay, so this is the solution and, uh, um, and, uh, um, well, yes, sorry. Uh, so we can also uh, write what that, uh, what, is, what the, this supersymmetry algebra is. And uh, in fact, it becomes something very simple. So this operator, so we have two operators which are nilpotent, and moreover, they anti commute. Uh, so this superalgebra is, uh, is very simple, and if you want, if, if you wish, the R symmetry is not part of this uh, of this superalgebra. And it turns out that for a genus bigger than one, this is essentially the only solution. Essentially, so what are the exceptional solutions? Uh, well, uh, let's see. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, so essentially, because so as you see from the equation, you can so let's say the let's take the uh, so let's look at epsilon. So the upper component is zero. So if you look in the equation. Um, so gamma mu inverts the, the chirality, and so you can choose any h tilde uh, because it still solves the equations because it's multiplied by zero. So h tilde can be an arbitrary function on the manifold, uh, but this is not gonna, so when you compute then localization results, so partition functions, this is not gonna affect the answer. So it's not the only solution, but in terms of partition function that you compute, it's, um, well, you get ev everything you want to get, uh, you, you get it from there. Yeah, this is more just a, to make sure I'm understanding things, but so you're saying this, putting it in this background supergravity is exactly the same on the nose as the sort of older papers of people like Whitten on topologically twisted theories where they don't mention any background supergravity, they just take the energy momentum tensor and they shift it so that the right things happen. That's exactly equivalent yes. to putting it? Yes. Well, at some point they start mentioning it, but maybe not in the very first paper. Okay, I just wanted to make sure I wasn't confusing things. No, 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 no. Uh, it's a very important uh, thing to, to remark. Yes, this is, ex it's just a different perspective on, uh, on the old topological twist. So one way to put it is that uh, essentially you do some uh, improvement transformation and you use a different stress tensor. Uh, which is, uh, it's in this different stress tensor essentially, well, the, the, old, the words that are used is that you change the spin of the fields according to the R uh, charge because you regard uh, uh, rotations as now a subgroup of the, um, so you take uh, U1 spin, 
you take u1v, and then you declare that the new spin group is uh, u1s prime, which is some linear combination of these two. Right? This is the old, old language, yes. But what does it mean? It means that now this group couples to the curvature of the spin connection. So when you turn on a spin connection for this, it's like you are turning on a spin connection both here and here, dictated by the particular linear combination that appears here. So effectively what you're doing is that depending on the spin connection, you also turn on a background for the vector, uh, for this vector field that caps to the R charge. So th this sh should show that they are exactly the same thing. Does it? I mean, are, are, are you... Well, yes. the details, but I okay. Sure. Are you saying that the, uh, an improvement of an energy momentum tensor is the equivalent to changing the background? Uh, it should be in this case. If, I don't know, maybe Guido can correct me if I'm wrong, but... Uh, I mean, you're changing the stress tensor. I mean, um, uh, and you still have stress tensor, which is uh, symmetric and conserves, so that should be an improvement transformation, right? What I'm saying is that like, you follow a coordinate transformation with some R transformation, right? Yeah. But at the level of changing the stress tensor, so one way to put it is that you take the stress tensor and you change it, in so you add something in such a way that becomes Q closed. <coughs> A Q exact. Uh, I think it can be interpreted as an improvement transformation. Okay. So we can think about that. Um, okay, so uh, another solution um, that I will call untwisted S2. Um, so we take the round metric on S2. So this solution will be specific for S2, will not work for an uh, arbitrary genus. Um, and then, okay, I, I call it untwisted because this time we don't turn on at all a background for the, for the, for the vector field that couples to the R symmetry. So we set this to zero, uh, but it's decided that we can still solve the equations if, so now we have to turn on uh, the, those scalar fields. Um, where R is the radius of the, of the sphere. And now if you, okay, you just write those, uh, those equations, the equations take the following form. Uh, and in fact, these equations are uh, been known also for a long time. These are called, uh, if I'm not mistaken, conformal kinin spinner equations. And, uh, um, and uh, well, on, on S2, there are, I, I, I mean, you don't need to op open a book to solve this equation. On S2, they are simple to solve. Uh, and it turns, out that it turns out that there are uh, two solutions, but in fact, there are two solutions for epsilon and two solutions for epsilon tilde. So in total, there are four solutions. And uh, for instance, for epsilon, um, should I leave this as an exercise? <laughs> okay, I mean, they are simple enough to write, so we'll leave it as an exercise. Uh, find this epsilon, but essentially in this, um, there are two integration, con two complex integration constants. So there are two solutions uh, for epsilon and then two solutions for epsilon tilde. And so in fact, let me, this is something I didn't uh, stress before, let me compare with the to the, this topological twist uh, 
So you see there is one complex solution for epsilon and one complex solution for epsilon tilde. So there are two supercharges, but we started with four, and so the topological twist breaks half of the supersymmetries. It's half PPS. Uh, however, this solution does better because this preserves the same amount of, uh, I mean, it preserves all supercharges. We have four. Uh, of course, we have to use the round metric. Um, Uh, however, um, the deformed supersymmetry algebra looks like the following. So, um, so, um, so first of all, this is not uh, the same as in flat space uh, because you don't just have uh, um, you don't just have uh, um, the lead derivative, which is a translation, but you also have uh, an R symmetry rotation, um, e even though the, the, this, this vector field is zero. So this comes from the second term, from that uh, bold Q. Uh, correctly, this deformation disappears if you go into flat space limit because uh, there is one over the radius of the sphere. So as promised, uh, the, 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 the supersymmetry algebra should reduce to the flat space one when we go to flat space. Um, and, uh, uh, but but uh, you see, um, the, the R charges of the fields appear explicitly in this, su in this uh, supersymmetry algebra. And so in particular, this uh, is related to the fact that the R symmetry now becomes part of the algebra. So this is different from flat space, as I said before. In flat space, R symmetry is an outer automorphism. But here, instead, in this algebra, the R symmetry is part of the algebra. And because of this reason, um, the, the, the we have to make a choice for the R charges. And this choice of the R charges will affect the theory. This is different from flat space. In flat space, you write down a Lagrangian. If you want, you can assign R charges. But of course, the Lagrangian is not, is not going to depend on the R charges. It's just an assignment that we make. Uh, and once again, this is due to the fact that the R symmetry is not part of the algebra. But in this case, it will be different. So the, uh, as we will see, the Lagrangians explicitly depend on the choice of R charges. They will appear as some curvature couplings. Uh, and once again, this is due to the fact that the R symmetry now becomes part of the algebra. Um, okay, so well, the other ones are zero. I already wrote it there. Um, and this, uh, so in fact, this KMU, uh, which we already wrote, so this is a killing vector. Uh, which generates, uh, as, you, as you vary this epsilon epsilon tilde, that this generates rotations of the sphere. So the SO3 that acts on the sphere. And in fact, the full uh, superalgebra uh, turns out to be SU2 slash 1 whose bosonic uh, subgroup uh, is uh, uh, at the level of algebra is SU2 times U1, uh, where this SU2, in fact, is this, uh, well, at the level of algebra, is the same as the SO3, which rotates the sphere. And this U1 is precisely the, the, the R symmetry. OK. Is there any question? Yes. So if uh, you preserve inside of the vector R symmetry the axial, uh, then you should uh, have a corresponding solution for a B model. Mm -hmm. And is there an untwisted solution too? Yes. So, so if you want to discuss the axial case, uh, so that is not uh, immediately uh, obvious how to reduce. Uh, it comes from four dimensions because the axial R symmetry if you do the reduction is accidental. But in fact, so but it should be very similar. So in, the, in two dimensions, um, it should look very similar to the R multiple. Somehow, it's, uh, it looks like an R multiple for the axial symmetry. 
um, in which now you have the conserved current for the axial symmetry. In fact, it turns out that it's the dimensional reduction of the Ferrara zoom in in four dimensions. Uh, but then when you go into two, you get this, uh, this, this vector, uh, if I understand correctly. Um, and so in that case, everything goes through more or less in a similar way, instead uh, where instead of having the vector like R symmetry, you have the axial R symmetry, and everything gets changed between chiral and twisted chiral and vector and twisted vector. The only thing to be careful about is that um, so this vector like R symmetry is never anomalous with this amount of supersymmetry, but the axial one in general can be anomalous. So the other twist, uh, since as we said, um, um, in order to make this construction, we really need that this is not just classically a symmetry, it should be a symmetry in the quantum theory. So you need to make sure that the axial symmetry is a symmetry of the, of the theory. Uh, but otherwise, everything is, um, goes through. And in fact, so this is very useful. And in fact, in the, in the literature, somehow this is called SU2 uh, slash 1A, because it's the one related to the A twist. And then the other one is called uh, SU2 slash 1B, uh, because it's related to the B twist. Okay. In principle, in principle so uh, uh, vector symmetry and U1 symmetry should be completely symmetric, right? Because of mirror symmetry. Uh, well, um, they're not completely symmetric because of... Uh, because of the anomaly you mentioned. Yeah, I mean, of course, if you go in the... M well... But the mirror is a different theory. Yeah. Yeah, so, so, so you assume that your theory has uh, chiral multiplets, which... Uh, well, only chiral multiplets uh, charged on the gauge symmetry. So in principle, you, you, you could have twisted chiral multiplets, Yes. Charged and uh, twisted vector multiplex. Yes. I think in that, in that case you can get anomaly for U and B. I think you're right. Yes. Yes. Sorry. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. What I said is for theories of vector and chiral, you're absolutely right. Yeah. yeah. You can rewrite everything. So if you have a theory with just vector and chiral, you can just rewrite it in terms of twisted vector and twisted chiral. You're right. Okay. Uh, uh, one last comment on this is that if you look at this solution for the scalars, you see that uh, uh, one is not the complex conjugate of the other one um, because there is no minus with respect to the two. And so in particular, this means that this background is breaking uh, uh, reflection positivity. Uh, now, if we study some theory that flows uh, in the infrared to a fixed point, as we said yesterday, we should not uh, be worried too much, because then in the infrared, these operators couple to a redundant operator, these fields couple to a redundant operator, uh, and we recover reflection positivity. Uh, but if you are studying a massive theory, this has some consequences. Okay. Okay, any other question before we go on? Can you put some chiral theory on sphere? Like 0, 0.2? Uh, yes, uh, there is. Uh, uh, but essentially, so if you do 0, 0.2, uh, let's see, essentially you are doing the, the, the twist. So, um, so that is essentially the only solution, I think. So there are no scalars in the graviton multiplet. Uh, you just have this vector field for the, uh, say, right-moving R symmetry. And so you, do, you can do the twist. It's called half twist. Uh, the reason is that uh, the theory does not become topological when you do that twist. It becomes uh, uh, essentially a chiral CFT. Uh, but still, it does, it does depend on the complex structure. It's, it's not topological. Uh, that is also true, yes. Okay. 
So now um, that we have understood uh, these, these examples, um, so now I would like to start uh, uh, discussing a uh, localization computation. So I would like to show one example in, uh, in, in details. Um, so at this point, you, you, you probably already saw one example in uh, Wolfgang's uh, lectures, but um, um, so this will be another example. Uh, but so, yeah, so the example that I want to study is precisely this one here, of, untwisted, uh, of uh, the untwisted background on the round S2. So let's actually take a black one. Sorry, before you erase it, could I ask one more question? Sure. So this is curious. So, um, so the g is g greater than one. Yeah. We have no isometries, and yes. we can find a background that preserves two supercharges. In g is zero, we have lots of isometries, and we can yes. find a background that preserves all supercharges. Yes. On a torus, which for which we have a u one times u one isometry, can we find a background that preserves all four supercharges? Uh, yes, I mean, you don't have to turn on any background on a torus because uh, it's flat and you just preserve all supercharges. Uh, then you can do a twist of that, of that story. So you can turn on, uh, so if you don't turn on anything, uh, what uh, your partition function is essentially computing the Witten index, uh, which is a number. Uh, you can make the story, and we will discuss this probably in the last uh, or starting lecture or starting tomorrow, I don't know. Um, you can make the story more interesting if you turn on uh, some, uh, ba um, some background for uh, ve vector fields in vector multiplets or also for the, for the R symmetry. Um, so then you really get a function, this is called the elliptic genus, uh, and, but this will break half of the supercharges. Okay, so we want to do localization uh, for uh, untwisted uh, gauge theories. On uh, uh, S2, and this will be around S2. In fact, this computation can be extended to a squashed S2, but the answer is not going to change or depend on the squashing. So we'll be happy just to do the round S2. OK. Moreover, uh, well, it turns out, so we are in 2D 2,2. And it turns out that there are many uh, multiplets that one can use to construct uh, theories with this amount. In particular, there are chiral and twisted chiral, vector and twisted vector. Uh, but I will restrict just to a simple subclass of this theory, so I will just consider vector multiplets and chiral multiplets. Um, and so in particular, these are dimensional reduction of vector multiplet in four dimensions and chiral multiplets in, in, in four dimensions. So. Um, OK, we already know these, uh, these, uh, these multiplets. Uh, so let, let me just say very simple things. So in the chiral multiplets, just to maybe set up the notation, we call it phi. So what fields do we have? So we'll not use superspace. So we'll just work in, co in components. Uh, so in this, in this multiplet, there is a complex scalar. There is a complex fermion. Uh, two component complex fermion, and then there is a complex uh, auxiliary field that I will call F. And I will also use F for the field strength, uh, but the field strength will have two indices, so hopefully there will not be confusion. Um, and, and then there is also the anti chiral uh, multiplet in which we have uh, all, all the tilted fields. Uh, and then there is a vector multiplet. So in this vector multiplet, we have a vector. We have a complex scalar, 
So I will use sigma and sigma tilde, and then there is a complex Dirac uh, fermion, and then there is a real auxiliary field D, and of course all, all of these fields are in uh, the adjoint representation of the gauge group, while this will be in some generic representation. And also it is useful to decompose this sigma into sigma 1 plus i sigma 2, and then sigma tilde is sigma 1 minus, uh, sorry, I'm using a minus here, so minus i sigma 2, this is sigma 1 plus i sigma 2. However, in, in Euclidean signature, sigma 1 and sigma 2 are complex. So, um, so these are not com th th these are in, in, in independent before we specify a contour. Um, and then it turns out that out of the vector multiplet, one can construct, uh, so one can repackage these fields into uh, a twisted chiral multiplet. Uh, that I will call sigma, and so the fields in this sigma are, uh, so the bottom components start with this, uh, with this scalar, and then, okay, the various components which are contained in here are, uh, uh, well, essentially the gaugini, uh, okay, these details are not particularly important. Um, I don't want to waste too much time in details that will not matter. Okay. <laughs> okay, <laughs> you want me to enter the details which are not important. Uh, okay, so when you do the splitting, so you get some components of the Gageino, go here, and then the auxiliary field. So in the twisted chiral multiplet, not the vector field appears, but the field strength. And so one component would be something like this. And it turns out that when you are on a curved manifold, there is a mixing with sigma. And the other one uh, is the other combination. Let's see, does this make sense? Uh, there is probably some typo in my notes. So this twisted chiral is a representation of the n equals to two algebra. Say again. The, the twisted chiral is a representation of the n equals to two algebra. Yes. So that means the vector is decomposable. No, it contains the same fields. I mean, these, oh, these are two fields, aren't they? The twisted chiral. Sorry. The twisted chiral are like two representations, not aren't they? Or, is it, or why do you see that in these two terms? Uh, let's see. Uh, Uh, let's see, uh, yes, that is true, but, okay, but it does not contain the vector, it contains the field strength. So if you really want to contain the vector, you have to use the vector multiplet. And, yeah, I'm not sure about this time because it looks like this is the same combination, so I might have yeah, a typo in my notes. Maybe there is no this minus sign. Okay, um, um, okay so, uh, to, so, so the important thing is uh, what, so now we want to construct gauge theories out of these multiplets. So what is the data that enters in defining these uh, and constructing these gauge theories? So uh, essentially what is the data that we have to specify or we can specify and we can play with. So, okay, so first of all we can specify the gauge group. Um, so for us this will be some compact uh, gauge group. Then, uh, we'll have the matter in chiral multiplets, so uh, the matter will transform in some possibly uh, reducible uh, representation of, uh, of G. So uh, 
we need to specify a matter uh, representation uh, R. I mean, there are many things that I call R. Hopefully, this does not create too much confusion. Um, so this is a representation R of G. And uh, um, uh, in other words, these, uh, the, the, the matter fields, um, well, in particular, this, this phi take value on some uh, vector space. And this vector space can be decomposed into the weights of this representation. So I will use often this notation rho uh, in R. These are the weights of the representation. Uh, now, as I, as I, as I promised uh, before, so the difference with respect to flat space is that uh, uh, now the R symmetry is part of the supersymmetry algebra. And so we need to specify R charges because these R charges will um, control some couplings in the Lagrange. Once again, we, we don't have to do this in flat space, of course, uh, but we have to do it here. So if you want the fact that SU2 slash 1 uh, contains this uh, vector like R symmetry uh, implies that we have to specify R charges. Uh, then we have interactions. And uh, uh, interactions are controlled by two functions. One is a superpotential, and the superpotential is uh, holomorphic and uh, gauge invariant function of the chiral multiplets, and should also be uh, invariant. Well, it should it should transform homogeneously under the R charge. In particular, in my convention, you have R charge two. Uh, if you wish, in other words, you can first specify the superpotential and then the R. Um, well, yeah, no, but you have to make sure because we need this uh, R symmetry. So the superpotential should uh, transform homogeneously under this R symmetry. Um, so if you want, this is some holomorphic function of the Karamazov. So this is exactly as in four dimension n equal one. But moreover, we have a twisted superpotential. And uh, uh, this will also be a uh, holomorphic function, but now of the, of the twisted chiral multiplets. Now, after we have introduced all um, interactions, uh, in general, there will be some uh, flavor symmetry which is left over. Call it GF. So this will be a sim this will be a global symmetry that commutes with the supercharges. So by flavor I mean that we, we, we don't, I don't include the R, the R, the R symmetry. And uh, um, and uh, uh, and then we can play this this game that uh, already Guido uh, mentioned uh, y yesterday. So we have this global symmetry. So in particular, in the theory, there is a current for this global symmetry. And the useful thing to do in general is to couple this global si this current to an external vector multiplet, sorry, to an external uh, vector field, a background vector field. Since the theory is supersymmetric, this vector field is in a super multiplet. And so we'll have other bosonic fields in this vector multiplet, and we can try to turn them on. Of course, we have to do that in a supersymmetric way. So Guido wrote this equation that the, the, um, yeah, the variation of the uh, background gauge geno, uh, let me call this lambda flavor. So this is a background fermionic field that is in this uh, background vector multiplet. Uh, this variation we impose it to zero, and this imposes some constraint. But uh, modulo this, we can turn on these extra parameters. Uh, and what they do, they control some couplings in the theory. And in particular, uh, what, what, what they turn out, in particular, there is a scalar in the vector multiplet, so this scalar here. So if we turn on this scalar in a background vector multiplet, 
which is a vector matrix for this flavor symmetry, what it does, and, and then you see the effect in the Lagrangian, uh, what it does is it turn on some masses. Okay? So these are called the twisted masses. Uh, so you can think of them as expectation values for uh, these uh, flavor uh, fields. And, and, and it is. Uh, Just avoid confusing, you're, you're missing a D of course. Okay. So this is the data that uh, uh, will control uh, the class of, uh, of gauge theories that we want to study. So as you see, there is quite some, uh, some data we can play with. Okay. When you wrote <coughs> delta lambda flavor equals zero, are you saying that's automatic because it's non-dynamic, or are you saying that imposes? No, no, that has to be imposed if you want to preserve supersymmetry. And it sort of, does it, what kind of constraint does that lead to on the twisted mass deformations? Uh, How does it, does it tell you you can't do certain things? So, let's see. Uh, so, in a, uh, let's see. Uh, I think in flat space, it imposes that sigma and sigma tilde is to commute. So, because sigma is complex, it tells you that it's diagonalizable. Oh, so it's in the Cartan. Yes, and then uh, you can okay. reduce to the Cartan. Oh, so that's why for abelian theories, I don't think it gives you any constraints. Uh, yes. Yeah, you can take the twist masses to whatever you like. Yes. Okay. Well, it, it at least uh, makes them constant. I mean, in principle, you could think of that's also true. Right? That's also true. That's also true. Yes. Uh, yes. Yeah, for a twist with omega deformation, the twisted mass can actually depend on the position. But in a specific way, I guess. In an arbitrary way, I mean. In an arbitrary way? Yeah, and, and then, then, by, it, but then you can satisfy the equation delta lambda equals zero by turning on... Oh, field strength. Yeah, yeah, field, field. Yeah, so of course these, these equations depend on, uh, on the setup that you have, the, the manifold and the, 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 the background for the fields in the graviton multiplet. Um, in fact, there is a, I mean, there is a hierarchy of, uh, if you wish, there is a hierarchy of equations. So we are working off shell. So, uh, so the variation of each multiplet should stay within, should only involve the fields in that multiplet. Uh, and this was, as we said at the beginning, this was one, one of the tricks that made it, uh, this um, uh, approach very interesting, this approach of Guido and, uh, and Seiberg, because we can just discuss, we don't have to discuss the specific theory, we just discuss the variation of the graviton multiplet. However, something that we do is that we go in a uh, uh, best zoomino gauge, and okay, we, we, we do it for the vector multiplet, but in fact we also do it for the graviton multiplet. And so because you go in a best domino gauge, what happens is that uh, if you want in this hierarchy of multiplets, you start with the graviton, the vector, and the chiral, the variations of the multiplets that are below in the hierarchy, they do contain the fields uh, that appear uh, above. That you would say, okay, if I'm doing everything of shell, this should not happen. But this happens because yeah, we are in best domino gauge. And so somehow we can first discuss the equations in the graviton multiplet. They are only depends on the fields in the graviton multiplet. But then the equation in the vector multiplet includes uh, include the fields that we have set in the graviton multiplet. And then if you go at the, va at the variation in the chiral multiplet or whatever other met ma matter multiplet we have, that includes the fields of the vector multiplet and the graviton multiplet. So in this sense, the equations that we get for that somehow depend on we what we have chosen for the uh, auxiliary, well, for the bosonic fields in the, in the, in the graviton multiplet. Okay. Okay, so, um, 
So, uh, okay, so uh, now that we have discussed the class of theories that we want, we have decided the class of theories that we want to discuss, we should construct actions. And uh, uh, so, as, as we said, this action can be constructed uh, with, the, with the methods that uh, Guido is um, teaching us. So, I will only give you the result. Um, so what action can we write? So first of all, we can write uh, uh, um, Young-Mills uh, kinetic action, so the kinetic action for gauge fields. And so let me write it, and then uh, if you want, the details are not important, but I just would like to point out some, some, some features. So this is the bosonic part uh, that involves the bosonic fields. And then uh, um, this is the fermionic part. And probably in front of everything, we want a gauge coupling. <coughs> And so, okay, so this is our uh, bosonic action. So what do we notice in this, this action? So first of all, as it should, if we send the radius of the manifold to infinity, uh, some terms disappear, and this action reduces to the flat space uh, action. So there is the standard Young-Mills term, there are kinetic terms for the scalars, there is this quartic coupling that just comes from the dimensional reduction from uh, four dimensions. Because uh, when you reduce from four dimensions, two of the components of the vector become scalar. And so just from the uh, Young-Mills term, you get this, this uh, commutator, or the square of this commutator. And there is the D term. And uh, OK, and this is also the, 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 the standard thing. Uh, however, when we put the theory on the sphere, we have some uh, uh, deformations uh, which are controlled by the curvature of the manifold. So I have these, these terms here. Um, okay, and uh, let me also write, uh, yes. so let me also write uh, uh, the matter action, so we can write similarly a kinetic term for the matter action. And so, so okay, so the here there is a similar story. So when we send uh, uh, the radius to infinity, we get rid of, uh, of, of some of the terms. And once again, this action is just the standard uh, dimension reduction from four dimension. Uh, however, now here, another feature that I wanted to show you uh, that, that I promised before is that, as you see, so these small r are the r charges for the uh, chiral multiple that we chose. And as promised, the action now explicitly depends on the choice of r charges. And again, this, is, this comes from the fact that now the R symmetry is part of the supersymmetry algebra. And of course, this feature disappears when we go to flat space. Um, um, now, um, if we want to perform uh, localization, 
we need to choose uh, a contour. And in fact, it's convenient to choose a real contour. So a real contour is just the obvious thing to choose. So fields that were real in uh, a Lorentzian signature, uh, we impose also in, in uh, so now they are complexified, become complex in Euclidean, where we impose that they're actually real. And uh, well, we if, if we had a, a complex field in Lorentzian signature, when we go to Euclidean, the field and this tilded uh, partner now becomes independent, and we just impose that they are complex conjugate to each other. So it's the obvious contour to choose. And in fact, if we choose this contour, uh, these actions, the bosonic part of these actions, uh, becomes, uh, well, the, the real bosonic part of this action become a positive definite and the integral, the, the path integral becomes convergent. So this is a good contour. Um, then we want to choose some supercharge Q that we want to use for the localization. So, so uh, a convenient choice is to choose some epsilon and some epsilon tilde. Uh, so we know that you have two choices here, two choices here. So we made one choice here, one choice here. And we define this, this particular delta Q. And we will use this as the supercharge uh, that we use in our formal argument um, yesterday. Consistently, does the choice of the supercharge affect the final result? Uh, in this case, no, because, uh, well, okay, so first of all, the final result should not depend on it in general, because what we are computing is just the original path integral. So localization is just a way to computing it. Of course, the result should not depend on how we compute it. But you might expect that the form of the result, the way in which it is expressed, uh, depends on the choice of the supercharge. Some choices may lead to some expression, and some other choices may lead to some other expression. These two expressions have to be equal, but they might be equal in a very non-trivial way. Now, in this case, this does not happen essentially because of the SO3 rotation on the sphere. Yes, thanks. So, uh, essentially, by rotations, you can map any choice to any other choice. Um, but in general, you might... Uh, I mean, if there are some inequivalent uh, choices, you might, uh, you might expect uh, different looking answers. Uh, and we will discuss tomorrow uh, an example, uh, which is not exactly this, uh, but something similar. Um, so we'll discuss how change in the localizing term can affect the, the form of the answer. Anyway, we make this choice, and then there is a nice feature, uh, something nice that happens, which is the following, that it turns out that both the superior Mills action and the matter action uh, are Q-exact. So they can be written as Q of something. And so this is very nice uh, for two reasons. Uh, so first of all, this is telling us that, in fact, the path integral that we are going to compute will not depend on the coefficients in front of this action. So in particular, there will not be dependence on this uh, uh, gauge coupling. Um, and, uh, well, this is nice because uh, in two dimensions, the gauge coupling is dimensionful. And so if you wish, the gauge coupling is setting for us a scale. Above this scale, we have the weakly coupled gauge theory. Below the scale, we have essentially the, um, the theory in which we have quotiented by the gauge transformations. Now, okay, the gauge field in two dimensions is non-dynamical, but the other fields are dynamical. Um, so if you want below the scale, we are in a strongly coupled phase in which we should use a, a different description. Now, the fact that there is no dependence on this, uh, on this parameter means that there, there is no dependence in this sort of uh, scale that we can think of as a cutoff. And so, in particular, our results is independent of the RG flow, at least for what regards of this, uh, this, this, uh, this parameter. Uh, well, the other property, we can interpret it as the fact that there is no uh, dependence on wave function renormalization. So, again, it gives us some independence on the... Um, on the RG scale. 
And so in particular, if you have a theory that flows to a fixed point, uh, our computation will be directly uh, sensitive to the uh, infrared uh, CFT. So essentially doing computations using the UV description, we'll be able to access information about the, the CFT. Okay, and I think that uh, I will stop here. Yeah.